Okay, we are ready to continue on in our study of Psalms. Uh, today, picking up in Psalm 59. Psalm 59. We find here, to the chief musician, set to do not destroy, the tune of do not destroy, a mictum of David when, he, when Saul sent men and they watched the house in order to kill him. Now this is the third sequential psalm set to the same tune because Psalm 57, 58 also are set to the tune of do not destroy as we saw last time. David composed this particular psalm during the time that he was in his own house after fleeing from Saul when Saul had attempted to kill him by throwing a spear at him that went into the wall, you know, and David got up and took off. David's wife, Michael, who was also Saul's daughter, helped him escape during that night from his own house while the men that Saul had sent in order to kill him the next morning watched the house. They were there watching the house. You can find this story back in 1 Samuel chapter uh, 19, beginning in verse 11. 1 Samuel 19, beginning in verse 11, where it goes through what took place at that time. Now, like the previous psalm, Psalm 58, the theme of this psalm pertains to the first fruits being witnesses to the close of the judgment that God will pour out on all of the haughty, evil men who will have gained positions of power over the nations, as well as all of those who fall in line and obey those very haughty, evil individuals. And all of that at the end of the age. That's what this psalm is, just like the last. Same, same basic theme. Going on in verse 1, Deliver me from my enemies, O my God. Defend me from those who rise up against me. Deliver me from the workers of iniquity. And save me from bloodthirsty men. Now this verse, what we read here, this has been the cry of the righteous throughout this first day of judgment for salvation and will climax, this will finally climax, this, this petition to God will climax at the end of this age. Verse 3 goes on, For look, they lie in wait for my life, or is a complete Jewish Bible, they lie in wait to kill me. That's what they want to do. They're bloodthirsty men. The mighty gather against me. Not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Eternal. Verse 4 goes on in the New Living Translation. I have done nothing wrong, yet they prepare to attack me. Wake up. This is a petition to God. Wake up, see what is happening, and help me. The enemies of the righteous are driven by hatred, by the spirit of murder that is transmitted to them from Satan the devil. Remember John uh, 8, 44. He was a murderer from the beginning. You know, and all of his children fall in with that, having the spirit of murder. Those individuals persecute and kill the righteous and have done so throughout this first day of judgment for salvation because the righteous always put God first. And they obey God instead of fearing the wicked and submitting to the sinful ways of the wicked. And so they're hated because of that. You know, people, people believe in peers doing what they want done. They want everybody to join them and support them. And yet the righteous will not support the wicked. Verse 5 goes on, You therefore, O eternal God of hosts, the God of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Do not be merciful to any wicked transgressors. Silah. Now this is the first of five times that this title, God of Israel, is used in the second book of the Psalms. Remember, seven times total in all five books the term is used. This is the first of five times in the second book. The name Israel, as we know, means prevails or prevailer with God. Prevails with or prevailer with God. God tells us that He is the God of those who prevail with Him. They prevail with Him. They are with Him. It is those who trust in and obey God who call upon Him to awaken here in this verse, awaken from his silence. They want him to 
Awaken from allowing humanity to continue plummeting to, into more perverse wickedness and evil without, without direct intervention. Pleading with him, wake up, don't let this go on. As well as they plead for him to fulfill his promises to punish all of the wicked. In the final battle at the end of the age, back in Revelation chapter, uh, chapter 19, about verses 20 and 21, we find that all of the wicked in positions of power at the close of the age, as well as all of those who follow them, are going to be exterminated. They're going to be killed. There will be none of those left that are at, uh, you know, uh, doing everything they can to reject God and to prevent His kingdom from being established. Verse 6 goes on in the New Living Translation. They come out at night, or as the New King James has, at evening they return, or at evening they come out, snarling like vicious dogs as they prowl the streets. Speaking here about the wicked. This is who it's speaking of. All of the wicked transgressors. They come out at night or in evening. Now the evening or night when the wicked attack the righteous like vicious dogs, as it brings out here, is the time of spiritual darkness. Remember when the Word came uh, there in uh, John uh, 1 verse 5? The Word came into the darkness, and the darkness didn't comprehend it because of how dark it is. Well, again, that evening or night, that time of darkness, is that which precedes the coming of the Messiah, who, remember, is whom? The S-U-N, the Son of Righteousness, the light of the world, who will establish His light, not only a physical light over Jerusalem, but spiritual light completely around the entirety of the earth. Verse 7 goes on in the New International. See what they spew from their mouths. The words from their lips are as sharp as swords, or the New Living Translation has... Their words cut like swords, and they think, Who can hear us? Or the complete Jewish Bible says they think, No one is listening anyway. The wicked have so deceived themselves in their arrogance that they foolishly believe they can do whatever they please without suffering any kind of repercussions for their evil. They're belligerent. Just look at what goes on today in this world. Look what takes place, especially in the high... We look at Olympia. We can look wherever we look, Washington, D.C. It's as corrupt as it can possibly be. Because the decisions are made are not for the people. The decisions are made for the pockets of the people who have taken so many bribes that they are so di and they're so dishonest. They're wicked and they're evil. And they've gotten these positions for themselves. You know, maybe a few here and there that are actually concerned about people, but how long will that last? Verse 8, But you, O Eternal, shall laugh at them, at the wicked, at the evil. You shall have all the nations in derision, or the New American Standard has, you shall scoff at all the nations. They think themselves to be something. When he pours out, his wrath at the beginning of the day of the Lord, as we call it, or the day of the eternal, God will completely overturn the plans of the egotistical minions of Satan the devil who plot and scheme to rule over all of mankind. They're going to be surprised what God does with them because they don't believe the Bible, they don't believe the Scripture, and they certainly won't listen to any prophecy. Verse 9 goes on in the New English Translation, You... God, you are my source of strength. I will wait for you. That's what the elect say. I will wait for you. For God is my refuge, not these evil people in the world. The narcissistic wicked are deceived by Satan into trusting solely in themselves. The righteous, however, know that they must always trust in God for his strength. His strength is the only strength that matters, which is what the Apostle Paul brings out back here in Philippians chapter 4, Philippians 4, verse 13. Here, Paul, the Apostle Paul states, I can do all things through 
Christ who strengthens me. There's where the strength of the elect comes from. It comes from the Messiah. It comes from the Savior. It comes from Jesus Christ. I can do all things. I can overcome whatever needs to be overcome by His strength. Not by my own power, but by His strength. Back in Psalm 59, verse 10, Tanakh translates, My faithful God will come to aid me. Actually, the New King James is much better here, sticking with the Hebrew, to meet me. My faithful God will come to meet me. God will let me gloat over all over my watchful foes, or as the New Revised Standard has, God will let me look in triumph on my enemies. The righteous will meet Christ, as we know, in the clouds of the sky above the earth. That is where they will meet Him, at the sounding of the seventh trump. They will all rise. They will be changed in a moment, to point, and then they will rise up. In fact, back in 1 Thessalonians, we go here often, but we need to never forget this. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, 17. The Apostle Paul states, Then we who are alive and remain, because the dead in Christ he brings with them, and they are changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye, if you will, and then in a moment in the twinkling of an eye later, then those who are still alive and remain. They shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord, with the Master, with Jesus Christ. So again, this ties right in with Psalm 59.10, My faithful God will come to meet me. Then, after meeting, after going then to heaven to meet the Father and celebrating at the marriage supper, the righteous will follow Christ back to this earth riding white angelic horses to the battle in which they will be witnesses to the destruction of the beast, the false prophet, and all of earth's armies being destroyed. They will witness that. Hence, they will look in triumph on my enemies. All of those, because my enemy is what God's enemy is. God's enemy is mine, uh, my enemy. And my enemy is God's, if we're following Him. All right, verse uh, 11, Psalm 59, verse 11. Do not slay them. Or the New English translation better brings out here, do not strike them dead suddenly, lest my people forget. Or lest my people, the New English translation, lest my people forget the lesson. So do not strike them dead suddenly. Because the... Uh, the uh, the, the request is to, to destroy my enemies. All of those who are enemies of God, destroy them. And yet, do not strike them dead suddenly. Rather than destroying the beast, the false prophet, and all of the armies of mankind, wherever they may be located or wherever they will be located during the time of the trumpet plagues, God will give all of those armies... And all of those leaders of men, the kings of the earth, the rulers, they, the way is prepared, remember, the demons draw them. Anyway, they come then to that area. And God will give all of them adequate time to assemble in one location, the plain of Megiddo in the Jezreel Valley. Back in Revelation 16, let's go back and read this. Revelation 16 and verse 12. Revelation 16, 12. Then the sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates, and its water was dried up so that the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. For they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the earth and of the whole world to gather them to the battle of that great day of God Almighty. Notice, leaders of all of the nations are going to be drawn, as well as these rulers from the east, the kings of the east. All over the world are going to be brought there to gather them together to the battle of that great 
day of God Almighty. And let's skip to verse 16. And they gathered them together to the place called in Hebrew Armageddon, or Har Megiddo. Armageddon. By assembling all of the armies and all of these corrupt leaders, wicked rulers, into one location, the result of their prophesied slaughter will never be forgotten. Don't strike them dead suddenly. Gather them all up. That way, this will impress upon everyone the power of God and how much He hates evil, how much He hates sin and wickedness. Going on back here in in Psalm 59, verse 11. So, do not strike them dead suddenly, lest my people forget the lesson. Scatter them, or stagger them. The Hebrew word actually means the root to cause them to tremble. Cause them to tremble by your power and bring them down, O eternal, our shield. Their arrogant, anti-God attitudes will quickly fade when they begin trembling in the fear at the, mo- in fear at the moment that the Messiah strikes them with a plague that dissolves their flesh. Remember back in Zechariah chapter 14, about verses 12 and 13. There, there's this plague that he sends out and their eyeballs melt and their tongues melt and you know, it goes on about all their, their bodies destroying nothing bone left. Their slaughter will result, as we know from Revelation 14 verses 19 and 20, their slaughter will result in a river of blood so great that their destruction will never be forgotten. And that's the point of verse 11. Don't strike them dead suddenly. Gather them together and do it all at once. Going on here in verse 12, the Revised English Bible has, Their every word is a sinful utterance. Let them be taken in their pride by the curses and falsehoods they utter. We need to remember that the beast and the false prophet will both continually lie and blaspheme God by claiming to be God and claiming to be God's prophet. By worshiping the beast, all who follow him will be blaspheming God. They will also commit blasphemy when they receive punishment during the bowl plagues. Let's go back to Revelation again. First of all, let's go to chapter 13 and note the kind of words uttered by the beast, the man who becomes the beast. It says here in uh, Revelation 13 and verse uh, 6, Then he opened his mouth, how? In blasphemy against God, to blaspheme his name, his tabernacle, and those who dwell in heaven. So this is the blasphemy. These are the words. Every, Every word it said is a sinful utterance. You know, back in in, uh, Psalm 59, verse 12. But let's go on to Revelation 16 and notice what comes from the mouths of all of those who follow these evil leaders. Or the people that they follow. I can't say they're leaders once again. Leaders, a bad word for for these, these individuals. Verse 8, Revelation 16, 8. Then the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and power was given to him to scorch men with fire. And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God, who has power over these plagues, and they did not repent and give him glory. In verse 10, Then the fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast, and his kingdom became full of darkness. And they gnawed their tongues because of the pain. They blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. Hence the reason they're going to be gathered up and melt and their blood run, as we know, the depth of the horse's bridles for 180 miles. Back in Psalm 59 again, and verse 13. Psalm 59, verse 13, the Tanakh translation. In your fury, put an end to them. Put an end to them that they be no more, that it may be known to the ends of the earth that God does rule over Jacob. 
Selah. The Messiah and his bride will be manifested in their glory so that all people will be able to see them at their coming. There will be no question. There will be no question that this is God and all of the saints with him. Then the beast and false prophet and all of humanity's armies will be slaughtered in the plain of Megiddo, which is in the land of Israel, the land of Jacob. Once the battle ends, the Messiah will descend on the Mount of Olives and establish his throne in Jerusalem. So once he pours his fury out, he puts an end to them, then all are going to know that God rules over Jacob because the immediate aftermath will be Christ's throne and his glory from Jerusalem after he stands on the Mount of Olives. And he will rule over just by what he does to all of the people assembled in the, the plain of Megiddo shows he's the one who has all the power to put them all dead because of their wickedness. So he does rule, and not just over Jacob, he will rule over all the earth. Okay, verse uh, 14, Psalm 59, 14, the New Living Translation has, My enemies come out at night, or, New King James, at evening they return, snarling like vicious dogs as they prowl the streets. Now this verse is a direct repeat, exactly the same in Hebrew. It's an exact repeat of verse 6. And it repeats verse 6 to draw attention at this point in this psalm to the contrast in the fates of the righteous who wait for God. Is it uh, back here in verse 9? It shows that the righteous are waiting for God. So it, it's, there's a contrast here in the fate of the righteous who wait for God and the wicked enemies of the righteous. Totally different because those fates of the righteous and the wicked, first of all with the wicked, then with the righteous, are given in the following three verses. Verse 14 is calling our attention to what follows. Verse 15, they wander, that is the wicked, wander up and down, or they work, they wander in search for food, Tanakh has. They wander in search for food, and howl if they are not satisfied. The wicked can never be satisfied. They can never come to satisfaction in this life by living in opposition to God and attacking the righteous. Whereas the righteous will attain eternal satisfaction because they look to God and they wait for Him to fulfill the promises that He has made to them at His return. So verse 16 goes on showing the fate of the righteous now after showing the fate of the wicked. But I right? The elector speaking here. But I will sing of your power. Yes, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. For you have been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. To you, O oh my strength, I will sing praises. For God is my defense, the God of my mercy. Or Tanakh has my faithful God, the New International my God on whom I can rely. You are the God on whom I can rely. Now again, it says here at the very outset in verse 16, I will sing aloud of your mercy in the morning. The morning will begin for the righteous when the Son, the S-U-N of righteousness, returns. When He comes in His glory at the seventh trumpet and the righteous at that point are resurrected to immortality. That's the morning for the righteous, for the elect. After being gathered together to Him in the clouds, as we saw earlier in 1 Thessalonians 4.17, the righteous will follow Him to the sea of glass before the throne of the Father, where they will then sing praises to Him and to the Messiah for all that they've done for the righteous to make possible eternal life for the righteous and for those who will later join them in the following days of judgment for salvation. Again, Revelation 15 brings out them singing the song of, the, of Moses and the song of the Lamb before the throne, and so forth and so on. All right, we're ready now for Psalm 60. Psalm 60 and verse 1. To the chief musician, set to lily of the testimony, 
a mictum of David for teaching. When he fought, the time of this, that he wrote it, he composed it, when he fought against Mesopotamia and Syria of Zobah, and Joab returned and killed 12,000 Edomites in the Valley of Salt. Okay, this is the sixth and the final Mictum Psalm in the books of the Psalms. The details given here regarding the time when David engaged these enemies of Israel vary. What's given here varies from the two other accounts of what happened. One in 1 Samuel chapter 8 and the other in 1 Chronicles chapter 18. Okay, In both cases you have other information. For instance, Joab didn't kill 12,000. You know, you go back and you find that his brother Abishai killed 18,000, but Joab, you know, not, not that. David is given credit in one of them. At any rate, I'm not going to go through because it's confusing if we don't have a chart to put this together. So I'll put it in the book, okay? Uh, or when we get the, uh, send the transcript out, we'll put that in there then. But uh, it gets a little cumbersome trying to explain it when you can't have a diagram to show you the difference. At any rate, there are differences. Doesn't mean anything. It's just a matter of basically understanding how Abishai and Joab, which were brothers, Joab was the commander. He was the top general over all the armies, but apparently Abishai, who was also a great uh, uh, warrior, uh, must have been given delegated authority by Joab in order for this to all fall together as it should. Okay. The focus of this psalm, the focus of this psalm is on the restoration of the descendants of Israel to the promised land following the return of the Messiah and the resurrection of the first fruits. That's what this is about. All right, we go on in verse 1. O God, you have cast us off, that is, cast Israel, the tribes of Israel. You've cast us off. You have broken us down, or as the, the King James has here, you have scattered us. You have been displeased. Oh, restore us again. Now remember, David wrote this, you know, when he was uh, king of Israel, hundreds of years before Israel was ever scattered from the land. So we need to keep in mind, uh, David understood this. He understood what was going to happen. You've cast us off, you've scattered us, you've been displeased, or restore us again. Because of their refusal to be faithful to the covenant that God made with them, both the northern kingdom of Israel and the southern kingdom of Judah, both of them, which again included, the, between the two, included all the tribes of Israel, they were exiled from the land that had been promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob because of their refusal to be faithful to God. They hardened their hearts toward God. The tribes of the northern kingdom, once scattered, once you know, pushed out of the land, have never been allowed to return and resettle the land. It's never happened since that day, since that time in the 8th century B.C. It hasn't happened. The southern kingdom... Now, the southern kingdom, as we know, returned in the 6th century B.C. They were exiled in the early part of the 6th century B.C. And then the, before the end of the 6th centuries, we're coming to the 5th century, they returned under Zerubbabel and Joshua. They returned. But the majority of the descendants of those who returned were driven out by the Romans in the 2nd century A.D., the Diaspora. You know, after the temple was destroyed, you know, and the problems that continued in Judea uh, with the Romans until finally about 130-something, they were kicked out. The Romans drove them out completely. Then the majority of their descendants returned and resettled the land in the 20th century. Not a majority by too much, but the majority of the Jews did return. However, prior to the return of the Messiah, many of them, the ones who are there now, will be killed 
and many will be exiled once again from the land, according to prophecy. Let's go back to Joel chapter 3. Joel chapter 3, and note this. Isaiah. Pages from sticking together. Man. Joel 3, verse 1. I'll read from the New English translation. <clears throat> For look, in those days and at that time, God says, I will return the exiles to Judah and Jerusalem. Now, that verse is referring to the time leading up to the founding of the state of Israel until now to where we are right now at this moment. Now, hold your place there, and let's go to Zechariah chapter 14. Zechariah 14 and verse 1. The New Living Translation, verse 1. Watch, for the day of the Eternal is coming, when your possessions will be plundered right in front of you. This is what's being told to the Jews in Jerusalem, in Judea. When your possessions will be plundered right in front of you, I will gather all the nations to fight against Jerusalem. The city will be taken, the houses looted, the women raped, half the population will be taken into captivity. That is, they're going to be taken out of the land. They're going to be enslaved and removed from the land and the rest will be left among the ruins of the city. So many will be removed, and what aren't removed will remain in the ruins of the city. Now, back to Joel 3 again, verse 2. And picking it up in the New English translation, Then I will gather all the nations. Uh, this is then. This is after Jerusalem has been conquered after three and a half years have expired. Then I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. I will enter into judgment against them there concerning my people Israel, who are my inheritance, whom they scattered among the nations, as we just saw in Zechariah 14, verse 2. They... Uh, my people, they scattered among nations. They partitioned my land, and they cast lots for my people. Or as the New Living Translation has, they cast lots to decide which of my people would be their slaves. They traded a boy for a prostitute. They sold a little girl for wine so they could drink. This shows you the value of the life of a Jew. The value of the lives of Jews will be considered so minimal, so low, that one of them, one of them, a child will be worth no more than the cost of gratifying a physical desire, a physical craving. And the fact that it uses a boy and a girl seems to maybe point to what we know is going on today in greater and greater magnitude that, that is just unbelievable. It's hard to believe we have pedophilia at the level that it is today. But this, to me anyway, it seems to point to this is part of the problem. Anyway, God will allow all of these things to happen to those in Israel today, because despite being restored to the land of promise, the majority of the descendants of Judah, though claiming the name of Israel, they claim to be Israelis, okay? they claim to be of Israel, which means prevailer with God. Okay, they claim the name, but they will not have properly represented God to the nations. Part of the problem, they rejected the Messiah. Most the majority did. But they also are not giving the right kind of witness to the world. 
There are the Orthodox and the ultra-Orthodox, which keep the Sabbath, but you've got the majority that don't, you know, that allow, you know, what kind of perverted uh, parades to go on in the streets of Tel Aviv and Jerusalem. God, God doesn't like that. Hence, what we read in Isaiah that we've gone to many times before, Isaiah chapter 10 and uh, verse 5. Woe to Assyria, or O Assyrian, this is the king of the north. This Assyrian is a rep, a, a represents the beast, the Antichrist. The rod of my anger and the staff in whose hand is my indignation, I will send him against an hypocritical nation, the King James correctly brings out. I will send him against a hypocritical nation, claiming my name but not living up to the meaning. And against the people of my wrath, I will give him charge to seize the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the streets. Now, the Apostle Paul, back in Romans chapter 11, let's turn back, the Apostle Paul revealed a positive outcome of Israel being cast off from God when he addressed God's calling and working with the Gentiles. He begins by noting that even though God has cast off the vast majority of the physical descendants of Israel, God has retained some of them as part of His spiritual nation, which He termed a predestined, those predestined back in chapter 8. You know, back in Romans 8, uh, verses 28 through 30, He talks about those who've been predestined. That's the predestined spiritual Israel, okay? the nation of spiritual Israel. But now, we're here in chapter 11 of Romans, and let's note in verse 1. I say then, Paul writes, has God cast away His people? Well, that's what David says back here in Psalm 60. Has God cast away His people? Certainly not. For I also am an Israelite. He says, I am a physical descendant of one of the tribes of Israel, of the seed of Abraham, of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not cast away His people whom He foreknew. Well, He hasn't cast all of them away, but because He has cast the vast majority away. But He goes on. Let's skip down to verse 7. What then? Again, remember, Paul is writing to the Gentile element of the church. What then? Israel has not obtained what it seeks, but the elect, spiritual Israel, the elect have obtained it. And the rest, that is the rest of Israel, they were hardened. Well, they hardened their hearts, okay? Just as it is written, God, and here he refers back to Isaiah 29, we'll come to this a little bit later, we'll go back to that passage, but just as it is written, God has given them a spirit of stupor eyes that they should not see, and ears that they should not hear to this very day. Because they hardened their hearts, God revoked the privilege that they had had of being His people. Because remember, back before He made the covenant, He says, I am going to make you my treasured possession, my own special people. Well, that was revoked when they hardened their hearts and they resisted Him. Now, Paul goes on here, uh, down in verse uh, 11. He goes on uh, to explain to the elect Gentile members that the time will come when physical Israel will be taken back by God when their privilege of being His people will be restored. So, verse 11, I say then, have they that is physical Israel. Have they stumbled that they should fall? Or complete Jewish Bible brings out better. Have they stumbled with the result that they have permanently fallen away? That is, they're permanently cut off and cast off from God? Certainly not. But through their fall, to provoke them to jealousy, salvation has come to the Gentiles. It's opened the door for the Gentiles to be offered membership in the spiritual nation of Israel. Now, if their fall or their stumbling, as some translations have it, their stumbling is riches for the world, 
and their failure, or their being placed, the complete Jewish Bible has here, and their being placed temporarily in a condition less favored than that of the Gentiles uh, is bringing, riches for the Gentiles, how much more their fullness. That is when they are restored. If they're being cut off, and look what the nations are, are getting. They can be chosen. Different ones can be chosen to be part of spiritualism. What happens when all of Israel is taken back? Well, it opens the door for everyone and all the other nations too. Every human being will have the privilege of access at that point. Let's skip down to verse uh, 22. Therefore, consider the goodness and severity of God. And those who fell, severity. But toward you, toward you, you Gentile members of the church, goodness, if you continue in His goodness. Otherwise, you also will be cut off. And they also, if they do not cling to their unbelief, Goodspeed says, will be grafted in. They'll be put back. For God is able to graft them in again. For if you were cut out of cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, that is you Gentiles, and were grafted contrary to nature into a good or a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these who are the natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, or as the New English translation has, so that you may not be, so that you may not be conceited. That hardening in part... Okay, 99 point something percent, okay? Uh, hardening in part. Has happened to Israel until the fullness or the full number, as the New Revised Standard and a few other translations have, until the full number of the Gentiles has come in. That is the number of Gentiles that God wants as part of spiritual Israel and part of the first fruits to take part in the first resurrection until they have come in. And verse 26, and so, or once that has happened, all Israel will be saved. The door will be open for the 99.9 whatever percent. It will be open for them. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. That is the ungodliness that Jacob has had throughout how many centuries? He's going to turn that away because he's going to open their minds and give them a heart that they can receive his spirit. For this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So again, the Apostle Paul makes it very clear about Israel being cast off. But it's only a temporary situation. Yes, for a couple of millennia, but nonetheless, it's only temporary. Now, back in Psalm 60, verse 2. You have made the land quake, or you've made the earth tremble. New King James, you have torn it open, mend its fissures, for it is collapsing. Now, verse 2 moves from the historical and current state of the Israelites being cut off from God to their future relationship with God, the time when that, when the time when that will actually occur that Paul wrote about. Multiple catastrophic earthquakes are prophesied to occur at the end of the age during the outpouring of God's wrath prior to the time that Israel will be taken back by God. In Revelation chapter 6, let's look at these earthquakes very quickly to understand why David points out that God made the earth to tremble. Well, there's a reason for that. Revelation 6, verse 12, I looked, John says in relating this vision, I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. And the stars of heaven fell to the earth, meteor showers, as the fig tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it is rolled up and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. Now that's a significant earthquake. Massive earthquake. And that's, again, at the opening of the sixth seal. 
This is before the first trumpet plague has struck. Now we move on to chapter 11 of Revelation and verse 13. Revelation 11 verse 13, we're told of another earthquake. New Living Translation, at the same time, that is, same time when the two witnesses are resurrected in the con uh, context here, there was a terrible earthquake that destroyed a tenth of the city, that is the city of Jerusalem. 7,000 people died in that earthquake, and everyone else was terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. So when was this? When the two witnesses are resurrected? So what event happened? The seventh trumpet. Seventh trumpet sounded. Two witnesses are resurrected. There's an earthquake that destroys a tenth of the city of Jerusalem. That's what it says. Then we move on to chapter 16 of Revelation, to the next of the earthquakes. Revelation 16, verse 17. Then the seventh angel poured out his bowl, this is the seventh bowl plate, into the air, and a loud voice came out of the temple of heaven from the throne, saying, It is done. And there were noises and thunderings and lightnings, and there was a great earthquake. How great? Such a mighty and great earthquake as had not occurred since men were on the earth. So this is going to be the most powerful of the three. And the first one is bad enough. It scares mankind silly. But now this is going to be even worse. Then Isaiah tells us about <clears throat> the aftermath of these earthquakes. Isaiah chapter 24 Isaiah 24 and beginning in verse, uh, breaking into verse 18 here. Uh, it's come to pass uh, that, uh, let's see, down the uh, latter part of verse 18, and it says, The foundations of the earth are shaken. The earth is violently broken. The earth is split open, which falls right into verse 2 of Psalm 60, is split open, and the earth is shaken exceedingly. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard. Now this is the great one. This is the one at the seventh bowl. And so that also, as we go back here to Psalm 60, verse 2, you've made the earth tremble. You've torn it open. Okay, just like Isaiah 24 brings out. Now we move on to verse 3 of Psalm 60. You have shown your people hard things. Complete Jewish Bible, you've shown them hard times. You have made us drink the wine of confusion. The Revised English Bible has, you have given us wine that makes us stagger. Now again, remember, this is Israel talking. These are the physical descendants of Israel. You've shown your people hard things or hard times. You've made us drink the wine of confusion or you've given us wine that makes us stagger. This is a reflection as well as a concise summary of the lives experienced by the Israelites after having been cut off from God. It's the way it's been. Despite having had God speak the Ten Commandments directly to their ancestors as the prelude to making a covenant with them to be their God, the descendants of Israel resisted doing what God required of them. They resisted because they preferred to yield to their own carnal minds, which again, as we know from uh, Romans 8, 7, are hostile. Carnal mind is hostile toward God. It refuses to submit to Him. And that's what happened to the Israelites. They hardened their hearts. Their minds were hardened, and they would not yield to God. They wanted it their way, not His. Back in Deuteronomy chapter 29, Moses warned. Moses warned them that this was the situation based upon his 40-year experience leading these hard-headed rebels through the wilderness. Here in Deuteronomy 29 verse 2, Again, we're looking at the wine of confusion or the wine that makes us stagger, and Moses tells them about it right here. Moses called all Israel and said to them, You have seen all that the Eternal did before your eyes in the land of Egypt, to Pharaoh 
and to all his servants and to all his land. The great trials which your eyes have seen. You've witnessed these things. This is not something you just heard about. You saw it with your own eyes. Great trials, the signs and those great wonders. You've seen the earth open up and swallow Korah and all the rest of the rebels. You've seen these things. You saw the quail come in. You've seen every week, six days, you've got manna that comes down and only on the seventh can you keep it over for the seventh. You've seen these wonders. And yet, the eternal has not given you a heart to perceive and eyes to see and ears to hear to this very day. After all that you've seen, it still has not gotten through. You haven't put it together. God wants you to be a treasured possession, which means you've got to do it God's way. And you still want to do it yours. You haven't learned. Moses told them that. Then over in Isaiah 29, Isaiah 29, God told Isaiah to remind them of that. Isaiah 29 and verse 9. Isaiah 29 and verse 9. Okay, the, uh, about the middle of the verse it says, uh, They are drunk, but not with wine. They're drunk, but not with wine. They stagger, but not with intoxicating drink. For the eternal has poured out on you the spirit of deep sleep and has closed your eyes. Now, Isaiah gave this to the descendants of Israel. Skipping down to verse 13. Therefore, the eternal said, Inasmuch as these people draw near to me with their mouths... And honor me with their lips. So they talk about the truth. They talk about me, about my greatness. But have removed their hearts far from me. Which means they may talk about it, but they don't do it. And their fear toward me is taught by the commandment of men. That is, it's not because they stand in reverence and awe of me. It's through human understanding, if you will. Verse 14 goes on in the Tanakh translation. Truly, I shall further baffle that people with bafflement upon bafflement, and the wisdom of its wise shall fail, and the prudence of its prudent, or as the New Living Translation has, and the intelligence of the intelligent shall vanish. And that's where we are today. Intelligence? The things you hear today? Where is intelligence? It's absolute insanity. Oh, you don't know whether you're a male or a female. You know, somebody gave me a cartoon years ago, and this little boy and girl pulls back, and, oh, there is a difference. Yes, pretty simple. That's pretty simple. You got two eyes? Look and see. That's what it is. But not today. Oh, no, intelligence says you, you could be born anything, you know, 64 different varieties or 37 varieties, whatever. Heinz ketchup, you know, unbelievable. But no, the intelligence, it's going to vanish. We are there. This is insanity that we're living in. Again, Psalm 60, verse 3. You've shown your people hard Things, hard times. You've shown your people hard times. Now, these hard times can also be a reference to the time of Jacob's trouble. The conditions that will be experienced by the descendants of Israel during the time of the outpouring of the wrath of God. Let's go back to Jeremiah 30 and be reminded here. Jeremiah 30, beginning in verse, uh, verse 4. Jeremiah 30, verse 4. Now, these are the words that the Eternal spoke concerning Israel and Judah, descendants of both the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. For thus says the Eternal, We have heard a voice of trembling, of fear, not of peace. Ask now and see whether a man is ever in labor with child. So why do I see every man with his hands on his loins like a woman in labor? And all faces turn pale. Alas! For that day, that day is great. What day is that? The day of the Lord, the day of the eternal. It's great. 
so that none is like it. And it is the time, it is what? The day of the Lord. That is the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. He is going to be saved, at least you know, a certain percentage of them. Not all, not all, but a certain percentage. Back in Psalm 60, verse 4, the Tanakh translates verse 4, Give those who fear you because of your truth a banner for rallying. No, give those who fear you because of your truth a banner for rallying. Selah. Going on in verse 5 in the New King James, that your beloved, or Tanakh has, that those whom you love may be delivered, saved with your right hand, and hear me. The remnant of the descendants of Israel that survived the fury of the wrath of God. At the outset of the day of the Lord and during the day of the Lord, they will at last possess, after going through all of these horrible times, time of Jacob's trouble, time of the outpouring of the trumpet and bowl plagues, they will at last, after all of that, fear God and they will seek to obey Him. They'll want, they'll crave to know the truth so that they can do it. They will be identified by God and instructed by him to proceed to the land of Israel. Once the bold plagues have ended and the Messiah, who remember, sits at the right hand of the Most High. Psalm 110 verse 1. When he enters Jerusalem. Isaiah chapter 11 speaks of this. Isaiah 11 verse 10. Isaiah 11 verse 10. And in that day, there shall be a root of Jesse, a descendant of Jesse, who shall stand as a banner to the people. This is a descendant of David. This is the Messiah. Note, who shall stand as a banner to the people. He himself will be a banner. They will see his glory as it, again, illuminates the entirety of Jerusalem. That will be part of the banner. For the Gentiles, the nation, shall seek him, and his resting place shall be glorious. That is the place where he finally stands, comes and stands at the Mount of Olives. And then his temple is brought into being, and he will rule from there. The Gentiles shall seek him, his resting place shall be glorious. Verse 11, it shall come to pass in that day that the Eternal shall set his hand again. The second time to recover the remnant of his people who are left. From Assyria and Egypt, from Pathos and Cush, from Elam and Shinar, from Hamath and the islands of the sea. He will set up a banner for the nations and will assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. So again, we see how this ties right in with verses 4 and 5 here of Psalm 60. And hundreds of years later, Isaiah writes this and tells us about the banner. But David had it first. David brought it out first. Going on in Psalm 60, verse 6. God has spoken in His holiness. Or better, in the Revised English Bible, God has spoken from His sanctuary. God has spoken from His sanctuary. I will rejoice. God is saying this. I will rejoice. I will divide Shechem and measure out the valley of Sukkot. Once the descendants of Israel return, once they return to the land, the Messiah will be filled with joy. He says, I will rejoice. He'll be filled with joy that his chosen nation will finally properly represent him. I will rejoice. And he will partition the land on both sides of the Jordan River for the inheritance of the twelve tribes. Shechem refers to the land west of the river, and Sukkot refers to all of the land on the east side of the river. Okay, because Sukkot means uh, tent, you know, it's a temporary dwelling. And Israel dwelt in that area before they finally took possession. And of course, Manasseh, half the tribe of Manasseh was on that side. And, 
and uh, Gad and I can't remember whichever other one. But <clears throat> it was on the, on the east side of the river. Okay, verse 7. Gilead is mine, and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet for my head. Judah is my lawgiver, or my scepter, as the Tanakh renders it. God now, in verse 7, begins focusing on the territory that comprises the land He promised to the patriarchs. He begins focusing on what's going to be done. The area of Gilead is located on the east side of the Jordan River. The tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim represent the whole of the northern kingdom because they were the prominent tribes of the northern kingdom. Ephraim and Manasseh, even as they are today, they continue to be. Ephraim and Manasseh continues to be head and shoulders above the rest of the tribes as far as their end time uh, areas where they're located. And then Judah represents all of the tribes of the southern kingdom here, as well as the tribe that provides the ruler over all Israel. Because again, remember Genesis 49.10, the scepter shall not depart from Judah till Shiloh comes, etc. And of course, Shiloh, Shiloh is the Messiah, and he will take over the reign. Verse 8, New Revised Standard translates, Moab is my wash basin. On Edom I hurl my shoe. Over Philistia I shout in triumph. These territories of the enemies of Israel, whose boundaries were acknowledged by the southern kingdom of Judah, will be taken by God and annexed to the land of Israel. These territories will no longer be inhabited by the people who had inhabited them anciently, which aren't even that way today. They're basically descendants of Esau for the most part, or descendants of Ishmael that are in those areas. The descendants of Esau who live in these territories at the close of the age will be recompensed by God Himself for their unrelenting hatred and attacks against the descendants of the southern kingdom who live in the land at, of Israel at that time, which is the now, right now, who live there right now. More specific prophecies concerning each of these territories, again, much more specific, concerning these territories, were later given by other prophets of God. Moab. Let's go back to Zephaniah 2. Let's look at a couple of these. Zephaniah chapter 2. Here we have Moab, uh, prophecies against Moab. And Moab, remember, was located in the southern part of uh, modern-day Jordan, okay? Moab in the southern part of modern-day Jordan. Here in Zephaniah 2, verse 8, I'll read from the New Living Translation. I have heard the taunts of the Moabites and the insults of the Ammonites mocking my people and invading their borders. Now, these are not, the people there today, there may be some, but the majority of these are not the Moabites or the Ammonites. Most of these are descendants of Esau that have taken over that land of Jordan. Okay. So I've heard the taunts, mocking my people and invading their borders. Now, as surely as I live, says the Eternal of Heaven's armies, the God of Israel, Moab and Ammon will be destroyed. Destroyed as completely as Sodom and Gomorrah. Their land will become a place of stinging nettles, salt pits, and eternal desolation. The remnant of my people will plunder them and take their land. That's what's coming in the future after the return of Christ. Now, Philistia is also mentioned here in verse 8. Philistia was located, as we know, and land of the Philistines, along the Mediterranean coast, beginning a few miles south of uh, Jaffa or Jaffa, Tel Aviv, okay? You go down to the southern part of Tel Aviv, go a few more miles, and that's where Philistia started, went all the way down to the border with Egypt, all along the Mediterranean coastline there, through Gaza, okay? In fact, that territory that we're talking about right now is what is considered Gaza. The descendants of Esau living in that area today 
which again led by Hamas, and there are others, as well as the ones in Lebanon known as the Hezbollah, they will assist the beast by killing many and enslaving many of the Jews. That's yet to happen, despite what we see going on right now. Joel, let's look at, go back to Joel. And let's go to chapter 3, verse 4. Joel 3, verse 4. We didn't read this earlier when we were there. Joel 3, 4, New Living Translation. What do you have against me, Tyre and Sidon? That's the area of Lebanon today. Who's in Lebanon? Hezbollah. Hezbollah. Lots of missiles, okay? Tyre and Sidon. What do you have against me, Tyre and Sidon? And you cities of Philistia, the Hamas and supporters of Hamas. What do you have against me? Are you trying to take revenge on me? If you are, that is, you're trying to take the land I gave to, jo to Jacob. You're trying to get revenge on me because I didn't give it to you? Are you trying to take revenge? If you are, then watch out. I will strike swiftly and pay you back for everything you have done. You've taken my silver and gold and all my precious treasures and have carried them off to your pagan temples. He calls it like it is. You can't worship the moon and not be considered a pagan. You, verse 6, have sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks so that they could take them far from their homeland. But I will bring them back from all the places to which you sold them. We saw before he's going to set up a banner and bring them back. And I will pay you back for everything you have done. I will sell your sons and daughters to the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the people of Arabia, a nation far off. I, the Eternal, have spoken. In Amos chapter 1 and verse 6, New Living Translation, this is what the Eternal says. The people of Gaza, here we're to Hamas again, the people of Gaza have sinned again and again, and I will not let them go unpunished. They sent whole villages into exile, selling them as slaves to Edom. So I will send down fire on the walls of Gaza, and all its fortresses will be destroyed. I will slaughter the people of Ashdod and destroy the king of Ashkelon. Then will I turn to attack Ekron, and the few Philistines still left will be killed, says the Sovereign Eternal. Zephaniah chapter 2. Let's go back to Zephaniah chapter 2. Verse 4 from the New Living Translation. Gaza and Ashkelon will be abandoned. Ashdod and Ekron torn down. These are the cities of, of ancient Philistia. And what sorrow awaits you Philistines who live along the coast in the land of Canaan? For this judgment is against you too. The Eternal will destroy you until not one of you is left. The Philistine coast will become a wilderness pasture, a place of shepherd camps and enclosures for sheep and goats. The remnant of the tribe of Judah will pasture there. They will rest, in, they will rest at night in the abandoned houses in Ashkelon. For the eternal, their God, will visit his people in kindness and restore their prosperity again. These are all prophecies about something that is yet to happen. Edom's territory, the third of the three mentioned uh, here in verse 8, Edom's territory extended over 100 miles south from its northern border with Moab. So it went all the way down toward Elat. Now, God casting his shoe, as he says here, over the territory of Edom symbolized him claiming possession of all of the territory of Esau, all of that land. There was a similar custom that was practiced in Israel when land ownership was transferred. Uh, in fact, let's run over to Ruth real quick. Ruth chapter 4 and verse 7. This was when Boaz was making the, uh, well, when the closest kinman uh, refused to take Ruth as a wife. And uh, Boaz then uh, was going to take the territory. Uh, and it says here, uh, Ruth Chapter 4, verse 7, the New Living Translation has, Now in those days, it was the custom in Israel for anyone transferring a right of purchase, or Tanakh says, in cases of redemption or exchange, to remove his sandal 
and hand it to the other party. This publicly validated the transaction. And so we see this is very similar to what God says here back in, Zeph- uh, back in uh, uh, Psalm 60, verse 8. Now, let's continue in Psalm 60, verse 9. Who will bring me into the strong city, or the fortified city? Who will lead me to Edom? These are the descendants of Israel. They're speaking. The descendants of Israel will ask God this question because He will require them to remove every descendant of Esau from the land of Israel and the territory of Esau, which will be absorbed into the land of Israel. And then they will be required to disperse those remnants of Esau among other nations so that Esau's bloodline will be diluted, diluted considerably, and they will thereby be prevented from establishing a national identity for themselves. Note back here in Ezekiel, Ezekiel chapter 25, verse 14, God says, I will lay my vengeance on Edom by the hand of my people Israel, that they may do in Edom according to my anger and according to my fury, and they shall know my vengeance, says the Lord God. Now, let's tie that in with Obadiah. Obadiah, verse 18. Remember, there's only one chapter of Obadiah. Obadiah, verse 18. The Tanakh translates this. The house of Jacob shall be a fire, the house of Joseph flame, and the house of Esau shall be straw. They shall burn it, that is, the houses of Israel and Judah will burn it, Esau, and devour it, and no survivor shall be left of the house of Esau, for the Eternal has spoken. God is not happy with Hamas not happy with Hezbollah, not happy with Iran, not happy with any of these people that continue to do what they do. Now, Psalm 60, verse 10, Revised English Bible. Have you rejected us, God? And do you no longer lead our armies to battle or march with our armies to battle, Tanakh has? Grant us help against the foe. In vain we look to any mortal for deliverance. With God's help, we shall fight valiantly, and God himself will tread our foes underfoot. He's going to be very much the one who destroys all of the rebels of the house of Esau. Now the question asked by the Israelites back here in verse 9, Who will lead me to Edom? That question reflects on their previous, the Israelites' previous state of being cut off from God, cast away. But now, now they've been brought back. They've been reattached. In these verses, verses 10, 11, and 12, they reveal now that their hearts are no longer hardened and that they trust only in God for guidance and success in carrying out His will, what He wants done. And so that brings us to the close of Psalm 60.